Io is one of the most curious objects in our solar system. The innermost of Jupiter's big moons, it has plenty of features that set it apart from anything else that we have ever seen, including volcanoes, aurora, and a sulfur atmosphere. I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum, and together we will go through everything you could want to know about the hellish world of Io. Let's get to know the context of Io a little better. Jupiter has 79 moons that we know of so far. There's a few that orbit close to the planet in and around the planet's rings. Beyond that are four large moons known as the Galilean moons, named after Galileo who discovered them in 1610. From innermost to outermost, these moons are Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Beyond them are the irregular moons of Jupiter, all of which are much further out than the previous moons. Io orbits very close to Jupiter, only 350,000 kilometers above Jupiter's cloud tops. This means from Io's surface, Jupiter would appear 39 times bigger in the sky than our moon. Io orbits Jupiter in only 42.5 hours compared to our moon's monthly orbit. Its orbit is actually in sync with two of the other Galilean moons. It orbits twice for every orbit of Europa and four times for every orbit of Ganymede. This is what we call an orbital resonance. Orbital resonances greatly enhance the mutual gravitational influence of the moons, which means the gravitational forces from the other moons cause the orbit of Io to have a little more eccentricity than it otherwise would have. This is likely the primary heat source for most of its geological activity, as Jupiter's gravity pulls and tugs on Io, causing tidal heating. At some points in its orbit, the tidal bulge on Io is thought to be up to 100 meters. This effect is similar to what we see on Earth with the ocean's tides being caused by the moon, although on Earth the effect is much more minimal, the tides only usually shifting about 2 meters from high to low. Io is getting 300% more tidal force exerted on it in comparison to our moon on us because of its close proximity to the biggest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, and the other big moons in the system don't allow the moon's orbit to be any less eccentric, meaning Io isn't going to be getting any respite anytime soon. A day on Io is the same as its orbital rotation, which means that Io is tidally locked to Jupiter. Just like we can only see one face of our moon from Earth, only one face of Io can ever be seen from Jupiter. Io is a pretty big moon, although it is the second smallest out of the Galilean moons. It is comparable in size to Earth's moon and shares a similar density, meaning it has a similar amount of gravity. But interestingly, it does have the highest density of any other moon in the solar system, one of its many unique features. Another is that it is composed of mainly silicate rock and iron, similar to the terrestrial planets and our moon. In comparison to most other big moons in the solar system, which are made of water ice and silicates, Io in fact has the least amount of water of any known body in the solar system. Its core is likely to be made of iron or iron sulfides, surrounded by a silicate rich mantle and crust. The core is not thought to be convecting though, as no magnetosphere has been detected around the moon. The mantle is thought to be liquid near the crust, and is at least 50 kilometers thick. This is where all the volcanism originates. Which brings us to perhaps the most interesting part about Io, the hundreds of huge volcanoes all over its surface. Before the 1970s, we didn't know much about Io at all although telescopes were starting to pick up hints that the moon was devoid of water and that it may have a surface of sulfur. The first mission to see Io in any kind of detail was Pioneer 11, although the quality was still not great. What it did detect, however, is that Io was made of silicate rock and not water ice, and that it has a thin atmosphere. Pioneer 10 was also meant to take some close-up shots of Io, but this was lost due to Jupiter's radiation interfering with the onboard command system. 
the radiation Pioneer 10 went through was 10,000 times stronger than the maximum radiation around the Earth. The next missions to Jupiter were the Voyager 1 and 2 missions in 1979. Voyager 1 flew by at a distance of only 20,000 kilometers and was able to take some impressive close-ups of Io's surface. What it saw was a remarkable landscape full of vibrant colors and a total absence of impact craters. It found mountains taller than Everest as well as volcanic pits hundreds of kilometers wide and what looked to be lava flows. Most notably, however, was the presence of plumes coming from the surface. This proved that Io is volcanically active, and it is still the first and only place this has been visibly seen beyond Earth, not including cryovolcanoes. Voyager 1 also confirmed that the surface of Io is covered in different sulfur frosts. This is what gives Io its many spectacular colors, it found that it is these sulfur compounds that dominate the atmosphere. Voyager 2 also saw Io in July of 1979, but was much further away at 1 million kilometers, although it still saw seven of the nine plumes Voyager 1 saw in March, which meant those volcanoes had likely remained active throughout those four months. The really interesting images came about with the Galileo spacecraft that arrived at Jupiter in 1995. The spacecraft wasn't especially designed to study Io, but it was able to acquire some of the highest resolution images we now have of its surface. Sadly though, Galileo never worked at full capacity, as it had quite a few mechanical malfunctions, which means we could have had even better images had it been fully operational. What it was able to see though were plumes from many volcanoes, as well as confirming the volcanoes were erupting sulfur and silicate magmas, similar to what we have on Earth, except the magma on Io is also rich in magnesium. The surface of Io is spectacularly colorful. The yellow plains are composed of mainly sulfur, the white areas are mainly fresh sulfur dioxide frosts, Towards the poles, the sulfur is damaged by radiation, which can be seen as the poles appear redder than the rest of the planet. In other places, the colors of red are the deposits left by volcanic plumes that reached hundreds of kilometers above Io. The most obvious deposit is from the volcano Pele. Sadly, an inactive volcano when Galileo was around, but Voyager 1 was able to see a massive plume when it passed by. In this image, this plume is 300 kilometers tall and 1,200 kilometers wide. In other words, roughly the size of Alaska. Interestingly though, the source of lava flows on Earth are typically the depression you would normally see at the top of volcanoes. But these depressions are not found on high peaks on Io. Instead, you have these lava lakes with high walls along the outside. Here is Loki the largest volcano depression on Io, 200 kilometers in diameter. These lakes are directly connected to the lava reservoir below, but usually have a thin layer of solidified crust on top. On average, Loki produces 25% of the average heat output of Io, but sometimes the crust on the lava lake sinks back into the lake, causing Loki to produce 10 times more heat than normal. This can especially be seen in one of Io's other big volcanoes, Tevashtar. Normally this area looks like this, but here the crust is seen falling into the lava lake. In this image where there is just white, the radiant energy from the lava curtain was so intense that the camera only registered white. In 2007, New Horizons used Jupiter as a gravity assist on its way to Pluto. It also used the opportunity to test its equipment. It focused its lens on Io during its flyby, and what it saw was amazing. Tavashtar, the volcano I just mentioned, was in full eruption, and the plume could be seen hundreds of kilometers above Io's surface. You can also see smaller eruptions around the moon. I must admit this is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen of space. 
Even though the volcanoes tend to be flat, it also has some extremely tall mountains, the highest one reaching 18 kilometers tall. These mountains tend to be completely by themselves, not as part of a ridge or a range. Although most are not volcanoes, lava lakes are found near them, indicating there are faults in the crust near these mountains. Another of the unique aspects of Io is its interaction with the magnetic field of Jupiter. Jupiter has an extremely large and strong magnetic field, and Io orbits within some of the strongest sections. The unusual thing about this interaction is that when particles from some of Io's thin atmosphere and its eruptions are lost to space, these particles float in orbit around Jupiter in what is known as a neutral cloud. This cloud can extend far beyond and behind the orbit of Io, but also surrounding Jupiter is something known as a plasma torus, a donut of ionized particles that follows the rotation of Jupiter's magnetic field. The plasma torus rotates a lot faster than Io's orbit, at 70 km a second compared to Io's 17 km a second orbital velocity. Io orbits right through the middle of it, with the particles from the torus bombarding the particles in the neutral cloud, exciting them to higher energies. These newly ionized particles feed into the torus, attracted by the magnetic field lines of the magnetosphere. These particles are lost from the neutral cloud into the plasma torus at a rate of about one ton of matter per second, which greatly increases the size of Jupiter's magnetic field. In fact, if it was visible, Jupiter's magnetosphere would be about the same size as the moon in our sky. Io's interaction with Jupiter doesn't end there. Jupiter's magnetic field lines, which Io crosses, Couple Io's atmosphere and neutral cloud to Jupiter's polar upper atmosphere by generating an electric current known as the Io flux tube. A flux tube is basically a concentration of magnetic field lines. The Sun has these between sunspots and is very visible on the Sun because of the charged plasma that flows between them. Io's flux tube causes an aurora trail around Jupiter's poles. This point here is the flux tube from Io striking the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. Aurora are also visible on Io, although they are not just limited to the poles. The different colors represent the different particles being ionized. Green is sodium, red is oxygen, and blue from sulfur. And there is everything you could want to know about Io. Learning about the plasma torus of Jupiter made me realize that there is a lot more to matter, electromagnetic fields and energy than I first thought. Thankfully I don't need to be ignorant of the facts for long, as Brilliant.org has some great courses on some of these subjects as well as the astronomy topics I've mentioned before. I've come to understand that for astronomy to be truly comprehended, physics and chemistry are also very important subjects. Brilliant already has a course on matter to get you started, and energy, forces, and waves will be coming soon, so why not give it a go? If you go to brilliant.org forward slash astrum, you can sign up for free to have a sample of their courses, and by using that link, the first 200 people will get 20% off the annual Brilliant Premium subscription. If you want to support my channel and also expand your own knowledge, I highly recommend this website. So I hope you found this video interesting. Personally, Io has always captured my imagination, as it is so unique in our solar system, so I'm very happy to have the chance to do a video on it. Also happy to have passed 100,000 subscribers. Stay tuned next week for my 100,000 special video I will be making. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this one, or even donate if you're feeling generous. All the best, and I'll see you next time.